This is the current federal tax developments for the week of September the 9th, 2019. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your State Society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers, and we're going to be bringing you this week some of the things that have happened in federal taxes during the current week. This week, we'll take a look at the IRS's release of the draft instructions to Form 8995. That's the form where we're going to compute the Section 199 Cap A deduction on 2019 returns. We'll talk about an IRS memorandum that discussed when you can claim a deduction for funding your pension plan. In essence, what counts as a payment and more specifically, what doesn't count as a payment to fund the plan. We have an issue where the IRS granted late filing relief for a change of accounting method. Good news, bad news was, of course, that we had to get a private letter ruling. That means there was a cost involved. We have a passive activity case. It's a little bit different where the IRS was trying to argue that something was not a rental. But it has to do with the real estate professionals, so that's why the issue of whether it wasn't a rental was a big deal. The IRS wins that case. And finally, we'll talk about a case of an S-corporation that discovered it had a problem with its S-Corporation election when due diligence was conducted for an attempted purchase of the company. Good news, they got the S-Election deemed good. Bad news, well, just like the other case, had to pay for a private letter ruling, and that's rarely a good thing for the cost of a ruling. So we're going to be talking some about all of those things this week. Again, remember when we finish this tax season, we are going to be doing some more continuing education courses. And one that's coming up the day after the closing of October 15th will be a Cal CPA rebroadcast of a session that I did in Albuquerque back in August. Uh, this will be a session that deals with advanced partnership issues featuring the new partnership audit rules. We'll have a discussion of that. It is going to be live CPE. So there will be a, you know, basically live interactive questions and answers during the day. Uh, we'll talk about it. We'll start at 6 a.m. Pacific time, 8 a.m. or 8 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, depending upon where you are in the country, obviously you adjust your time zone for that. Check with your state society. Participating state societies will be involved in this program as well. You can sign up there. You know, you'll qualify for all the membership benefits you qualify for for getting into the course. So take a look and sign up at those locations. And hopefully we'll see you there on the day for the partnership course. Well, let's go ahead and start with our first development for this week. This week, we had the IRS issued new draft instructions for Form 8995. Now, Form 8995, for those who don't remember, we knew about that. We got Form 8995 and 8995A. Those forms calculate for us a qualified business income deduction. 8995 is the simplified computation. 8995A deals with the other, not so simplified calculation for the qualified business income. The instructions we have at the moment are only for the simplified version. But it does give us a few more, a few pieces of information beyond what we already knew about how the IRS views this deduction. This particular uh, set of instructions ends up and gives us a 17-step flowchart. Remember, this is for the simple version. 17-step flowchart for computing qualified business income. It actually goes over two pages. So you'll find that it does walk you through most of the significant issues that are involved in calculating in calculating qualified business income. A couple of things, though, that are interesting in this document is it does clarify a few things. And one of the things that it clarified, and it's always been bad with these informal clarifications, the instructions also say that any amounts that are related to trader business income have to be adjusted. And that includes, but is not limited to, charitable contributions. Now that's new. We had never been told before that a charitable contribution that is related to the business is going to reduce QBI. Now, it's kind of an interesting issue because obviously generally we claim charitable contributions on Schedule A. The instructions don't tell us what happens if we take the standard deduction, but I would assume we don't make any adjustment for that. And more to the point, we may be asking if the charitable contribution is truly related to the trader business, then potentially it's a 162 deduction that should have been on the front page of the return anyway. 
Okay, open issue. A couple of other things they add in that, oh, by the way, pick this up sentence will be unreimbursed partners expenses. That we were kind of aware they thought that should be subtracted, even though the proposed regs didn't get in, or I should say the final regs kind of dodged that issue. Also, they talk there about business interest expense. Business interest expense also was never fully clarified, though I think most of us believed that if you got the deduction for business interest expense under Section 163J, then, yeah, you should probably reduce QBI by the 163J limits if the interest is disallowed. Obviously, that doesn't reduce business investment in, or business income. That also suggests, therefore, that S corporations, partnerships, etc., should leave those calculations out in a flow-through calculation. When you are, let's say, a large, you know, when you're not $25 million, you're passing it out so that your shareholders can figure out if they're personally limited. Then, technically, your QBI probably should not include that interest deduction. It's kind of an interesting mess, and that that whole area. Hopefully, when we get the instructions for the S-Corporation returns and the partnership returns, there has to be a little clearer this year about how the pass-through should be computing the QBI numbers to go on the return. In fact, practical matter is because of the changes they made where we've now gotten rid of those four numbers and we're going to actually just get a description line. I suspect the answer is yeah, that the service expects us to be a little more descriptive about how we're computing QBI at the partnership or S-Corp level, and then the shareholder or the partner is going to make the computations on their own return. Next item that comes up is we're going to look at a Chief Counsel Advice here, Chief Counsel Advice 2019-35011. It was issued on August the 30th, 2019. And this particular ruling, and it's it's timely because we're coming up on the September fifth, September sixteenth date for pass through entities. And as you may be aware, you can claim a contribution for funding your retirement plan if you have a qualified retirement plan or a SEP, if you do it by the extended due date of the sponsoring entity. And the rule says that it needs to be paid by that date. This chief counsel advice looks at what does it mean by the word paid. In essence, a case a number of years ago that went to the U.S. Supreme Court, 1977, the Donnie Williams versus Commissioner case, United States Supreme Court case 429 U.S. 569. That case looked at a situation where a taxpayer who was on the accrual basis was attempting to claim that it was paid. And in his case, as I recall, in the case of Mr. Williams, uh, essentially, you know, gave a note. And so, you know, we gave a note to the plan on the accrual basis that would allow us a deduction, the theory was. And so, therefore, it was paid because accrual basis looked at paid. The U.S. Supreme Court generally said no. In their view, the word paid here was talking about some sort of transfer of assets or cash, not just a promise to transfer assets or cash at a future date. That there was a reason why Congress worded it this way. So you have to live with what's there. Well, this basically chief counsel advice now looks at expanding this up and making some clarifying examples of how this would go. The memo basically comes and quotes from the cases that there has to be an outlay of assets or reduction of assets of the sponsoring organization in order for there to be a current deduction. As well, the plan must have unfettered use of the assets in question. Specifically as well, and this comes from the Williams case, a promise to pay, even if it's a secured promise to pay, does not count for this purpose. Neither do assets that are encumbered. You know, the plan has to have the ability to deal with this. The point of this, as the memorandum argues from the Supreme Court case, you know, Congress put these rules in place because they're trying to protect the interest of the employees in the plan and we can't have lots of things encumbered we can't sell or we have special rules that's going to be kind of a problem that essentially we need the plan to have full access to all assets and we need them to have real assets not just a promise eventually to get them now the memo itself goes on and gives us a number of examples and it talks about an employer giving their own promissory note they make the position that that's never going to be considered deductible. Uh, if an employer contributes its own publicly traded debt, that's still really a promise to pay. 
So I don't care that, let's say, there are bonds out there. If you're a public company, you go out and you buy your own bonds and then you give them to the plan. They're saying, well, you just moved a promise to pay. We don't think that would work. Uh, not surprisingly, they're not really thrilled where you just put on your books as accrued and you put it on the plan as receivable. That probably doesn't work either. And the fourth category they looked at there in the example was the treatment of the contributed asset as an asset of the employer for accounting purposes. They note that whether or not it's on the balance sheet of the employer is a factor, but not a absolute controlling factor in whether or not a contribution has been made. They do note that a, you know, we need these things for a trust to be able to have the asset. The asset has to be accessible to the plan. There are potential issues if there are put or call options. If the employer has a right to bring it back at a certain price to call it, that's probably going to be a problem regardless because now the employer, essentially that's a restriction. You can't very well get rid of an asset if somebody has a right to force you to sell it back to them. Put options, it says, can also be a problem depending upon how their structures and basically restrictions on the trustee's ability to transfer assets are always going to be an issue. So we have to be careful in that realm. Obviously, the smartest thing to do by far is transfer the cash. And, you know, I would say that anybody trying to go with anything else would have to look at this chief counsel advice very, very, very carefully. And it's really one of those things of you don't want to go here. You know, if at all possible, you want to avoid going this direction. Next up, we're going to take a look at an IRS private letter ruling 2019-35002. This was issued on August 30th of 2019. And this was a case of a taxpayer. And the plan was simple. The taxpayer was going to make an automatic accounting method change using Form 3115 attached to their return for the year in question. And as you may recall, at the same time, you mail a copy to an address the IRS gives you. In this particular case, the address in question would have gone to Covington, Kentucky. We know that that's changed a few times over the years and will probably continue to change. So you always go back and double check where it's to go. Well, the problem in this case was that they put it on the return. They had everything in there. It got submitted up. But apparently they never got around to actually mailing the second copy to Covington, Kentucky. You're supposed to you know, have the original on the return. And at the same time you file the return, you're to mail the copy off to you know, the, third, the other office of the IRS. They failed to do that. What that means is they had no permission to make the change of election. And in this case, presumably, that would have been costly to the taxpayer to have lost the right to make the change and to have been forced to try to make that change in a later year. It would have at least involved amending the returns for the years affected. And presumably, as we say, they just didn't want to go through that. That presents a problem. Because this particular rule is set by the IRS and regulations, the date by which, you know, how you do this and when you have to send these documents to them. Since that's governed by regulation and a revenue procedure, the IRS does say that they have the right to grant a waiver. This is found in Regulation 301 3 uh, if you never look there, if you miss a date for an election, and this is considered an election, you want to go look at the regs under 301-9100-123. Some elections, you can get, you know, there, there's an automatic six-month rule, which is if you make a late election, if you made an election, uh, but it's required to be done by the due date, including extensions, oh, you didn't get the extension, well, they'll always give you to the extended due date to send the election in. That's fine. That one covers, again, regulatory elections. Now, please remember, it does not cover statutory elections. That, that's more of a problem. They also have a special list on 301-900-2 of a few elections that you have an automatic extra year. Uh, the most prominent in that list will be the 754 election for a partnership that wants to make an adjustment under either 743 or 734. That election can be filed up to a year late. And if neither of those cover you, then you have to go to the IRS under 301-9100-3. And the bad news here is that you have to pay for a private letter ruling. 
And one of your issues here, you can get this relief, but you have to establish to the satisfaction of the IRS that the taxpayer acted reasonably and in good faith, and the grant of relief will not prejudice the interest of the government. The minimum fee to get a ruling of this sort, basically these days, is right at $11,000, $11,800, make that correct. So that's a problem. Also, getting these rulings involves significant professional time to draft up the request, to interact with the service, you know, about the request and if it'll be granted, uh, to then, you know, get all the paperwork together. If you've never done one of these, you should be aware that as the person asking for the ruling, you basically draft the IRS's letter for them. You're trying to get something signature ready for the IRS, and what you end up doing is copying another ruling to just get something that is going to be okay in the language, and then you negotiate it. And then you wait for the ruling to come in. The ruling comes in, we're in good shape. Obviously, though, 11800 in this case, the taxpayer had, you know, the CPA failed to advise them to send the extra copy in. Now, the good news is a mistake by an advisor of this sort. We know how, like we've talked about before, if there's like a failure to get an extension filed by the advisor, that's not considered to be reasonable cause and you can't get relief from that. In this case, though, if you relied on the advisor and the advisor made a mistake somehow and, you know, dropped the ball and didn't get some paperwork through, in this case, the IRS is saying that's okay. So it's one of those things where here an advisor error is okay, there it's not. Uh, the advantage here, I think really the issue here from the IRS's perspective is they're perfectly aware there is that minimum fee to get the ruling and all that time. And they're also pretty sure that uh, the advisor is going to end up eating a lot of that time or paying. It's going to be either eating a lot of that time or actually paying for somebody else to do it. And it's going to probably have to write the check for the uh, fee. Their idea is advisors not doing this to, you know, just take an easy, cheap way out. They're going to ignore everything. Uh, no, they, they, they've got issues. They've got problems. I think that's not officially why the IRS is okay with it, but unofficially, I suspect it has an impact. They did receive the relief to make the late election. This is fairly normal. Uh, you know, the IRS almost always grants relief in a case like this. It's going to take about six months, but you'll get it. As I said, the only bad news is having to come up with a fee to get the private lettering request. Well, there's also one other bad thing. You've got to tell the client that, oh, by the way, we fouled up because, yes, the advisor's got to fall on his own sword. Remember, they have to show the taxpayer acted reasonably, which means the taxpayer fouled up because the CPA forgot to give them the document. So that, that that's also a problem. And then we work from there. So it's kind of an interesting mess. Next up. We have a case of Eger, Eger, I guess, versus United States, U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California, case number 18 CV 00199 DMR. Uh, the opinion was issued on August the 30th. And this particular case deals with passive activities and deals with real estate and whether the real estate in question, three properties in question, constituted rental properties. Now, normally you'd think with that question that the taxpayer wouldn't want it to be rentals because, remember, rentals are automatically passive. So you'd probably think the taxpayer wants it to be a trader business and the IRS is trying to argue it's a rental. But you'd be wrong. Part of the reason you'd be wrong, which suddenly now you begin to figure out instantly why it's a reversed item, is the taxpayer in this case was clearly a real estate professional. There was no question he spent time in real estate. He had a ton of rentals, spent a ton of time in real estate. He's clearly a real estate professional. He had on his return grouped together 33 different properties. Now, the IRS agreed that 30 of those were standard rentals, but they disagreed with three properties that were in resort locations that, you know, had issues with what went on. One of the issues here was that these are things like, you know, you, you buy a condo on a, you know, in Hawaii, you know, or Mexico in this case, I recall we had Mexico, Colorado, and Hawaii. We had these properties. They were on resorts. He hired a management company for each and a management company had the right in each case to rent the properties out. 
So the management company could rent the properties out to people who wanted to stay at the location. And the taxpayer, you know, gave them that. But in each case, the taxpayer retained the right, either absolutely or at least for a specified number of days during the year, to take the rental out of use and use it personally. So they had to give certain notices. There was a one of the rule, one of the agreements, because there were three different. Uh, specifically, they only had a certain number of days. They could do it no more than X number of days during the year. Now, the taxpayer never actually did that. In none of these cases did they use the properties personally. But the problem, as the IRS viewed it, was they had the right to use each one. Now, we got a back and forth fight here because here's the catch. We're looking at the issue of, remember, there's a series of exceptions to when a rental property is not going to be a rental for the past activity loss rules. And one of them is if the average period of use is seven days or less. The IRS argued that, in fact, the average days of use of the people that actually use the facility, that use those properties, was less than seven days. You know, people would go to a resort, they'd stay there for maybe, they'd stay there for a week, they'd stay there for four days, they'd stay there for a weekend. So there were a lot of people, you know, not very, very few times did somebody actually stay there for a period of time in excess of seven days. The taxpayer said, no, 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 that, that, that's wrong. See, here's the catch. We have a contract not with the lessees. We have a contract with the management company. And the management company had the use of the property for the entire year. So we're viewing this rental as saying that the management company had the right to use the property for the entire year. And because of that, we're, we're not covered by this problem. We don't have this issue. Well, you know, the, the IRS obviously had issues with that. But the taxpayers cited the cases of White versus Commissioner, taxpayer summary, tax court summary opinion, 2004-139, and Harrison versus Commissioner, tax court memorandum decision, 2386. Those were both cases where a taxpayer had signed over the rights to the property. And, you know, and basically, and then the other party had subleased the property out. To various parties and the taxpayers said well you know we're, we're just like that but the court distinguished the case and this is probably where our problems come the court said there's a difference in your case in the cases of white and Hairston, the taxpayer essentially gave up all rights to use the property for the entire year they allowed but didn't require the other party to sublease. I realize the parties did sublease it, but they allowed them to do it. They had the full right to use the property. They said, here's the difference. You're trying to tell us that the period of use would generally include the period a party had the right to use it. They're saying, even if we accepted your view of right to use, because remember, the, the IRS position would be that, in fact, they, they were just agents looking to lease the property for them. They weren't actually doing anything with the property. But even if we accepted the taxpayer's view, the taxpayers had the right to essentially walk in and take days out of the mix. There was no guarantee that the ta that you know this company would have use of this, would have the right to use the property for continuous periods that averaged more than seven days. Now, reality is they did, but the court said that's not the key. You're arguing because they didn't really use it unless it was leased, they, unless they got the sublease and it wasn't being used. They say, you're not arguing use, you're arguing right to use. And they're saying their right to use was contingent. They didn't know any day they'd have the right to use until your notice period expired. And, you know, their notice period expired day by day. So because of that, you know, this is not a rental. Since it's not a rental, these three properties, which presumably came out of the loss, had to come out of the mix. What this shows, which I think is important, is you've got to be very, very careful when you're relying on a case or a letter ruling or whatever. Remember, the first defense for the IRS or anybody in the case of a factual-based issue, like a case, a case, so a case decided that X, you know, that A could do X. 
Well, the best way, if you're arguing my client B should also be able to do X, because look at that case, the best the best defense against that, and if the service is saying your client has to be treated and doing and with X, because I've got this case over here, is to distinguish the facts. And the reality is every case is different. So there always are distinguishing characteristics. The key question becomes, are the distinguishing characteristics significant? So it's really important, and this case illustrates that, that if you have cases, because I'm sure when this came up, the White and Hairston case, they felt they were good on those cases. You have to, though, take a look and say, okay, what's different about what we have versus those cases? There's going to be differences. After identifying your differences, then you have to ask yourself seriously, are any of these potentially significant enough that the court would say that, you know, they could have made a difference in the first decision? And so this court will look at it and see if that can be distinguished. This was a case of, yeah, having distinguishing characteristics. This is also a good reason my second big rule of doing anything tax research wise. All too often, I have people who do research and they'll come in carrying like, you know, the federal tax coordinator. They'll come in with a BNA portfolio. They'll come in with, you know, a simple tax guide, master tax guide, whatever we talk about, you know, come in with those things, tax handbook. And the problem is those are all editorial sources. An editorial source, as I can tell you, because I write what you're seeing if you go get the download this week of the articles, these are all editorial descriptions of the cases. The cases are much longer than what's in the document. So they have to be edited down. The facts have to be reduced to what the author may believe were significant. But you, if you're going to rely on a case, have got to go look at the real thing. The summaries or what's written in the documents you can get on our website. Those are to give you an idea of whether a case might be something of interest in your situation. But if you're going to rely on it, you got to check it because distinguishing the case is a significant item you've just got to consider. You know, especially people who get, I remember you, old days having the CCH uh, federal tax reporter and they had all those annotations that would have maybe five lines about a case. A case doesn't really boil down to five lines in an issue. You know, again, those were not meant to be relied upon. They are meant to be a starting point. That's what makes it crucial. Next, we have final private letter ruling for this week. Private letter ruling 2019-35010. This was an S corporation. And, you know, we have S corporations. Taxpayer had a corporation. And this corporation apparently operated to C for a while before it made its S election. Because while it was before it became an S corporation, it made two revisions to its articles of incorporation. And the the first revision divided the interest between voting and non-voting stock, essentially, right? We had basically class A, class B stock, class A stock retained voting power, class B stock held no voting power. Okay. Then a little while later, we came back and we made another revision. And in this case, we changed it to say that Class A and Class B stocks were equal share of liquidation until a certain amount had been paid to each share. And once we had that much paid per share, uh, the Class B shares got all the additional liquidation. Obviously, that was probably some way to try to lock down value and transfer growth to the other party. Now, this is sitting there in the Articles of Incorporation. And we go for a few more years. The client suddenly decides that, hey, we should be an S corporation. The taxpayer did. So they made an S election. One of the key things you have to remember about an S corporation is an S corporation has a number of special requirements in order to be an S corporation. And one of the key ones is it has to have one class of stock. Under Regulation 1.1361-1L, one of the key definitions for one class of stock, you know, we have a federal law definition of what one class of stock is. Now, you might think, lo looking at this, it's like, well, obviously, they established A and B class stocks when they did the voting, non-voting. 
But that's not actually the problem. The first change did not disqualify the test selection. That change is fine, even though those are clearly two classes of stock by any normal definition. For federal tax law purposes, for S corporations, they aren't. Federal tax law purposes looks at class of stock under the S corp rules as only a question of do you have a difference in the amount that you are allowed to receive on distributions for each year, regular distributions, or in liquidating distributions. If different stocks, if different groups of stocks have different rights on either one of those, you have two classes of stock. And that, by the way, is true even if the right is never used and this right had never been used. Well, obviously, our problem came up. We have this problem, but, you know, I've been approached, and I remember it was on uh, slash r slash taxes on Reddit uh, about a couple months ago. Somebody pointed out that in reality, they've been in practice for years. They had never seen an agent question whether an S corporation was really an S corporation. And that's true. I don't think I can recall hearing anybody tell me they've ever had an agent question the issue. But I also know there are people who make really good money off this area. Why? Because here's where the problem comes in. When you go to sell this company, remember, we have now here, if they were truly were a C corporation, every year they showed income, they should have been paying tax. That tax has never been paid. There's penalties, there's interest. It could be really nasty if they came back. The IRS said, you know what? You haven't been an S corporation for the last 12 years. You never were an S corporation. You are still a C corporation like you were initially. And even if we get into that argument, whether the S corporation return counts as a filing for the statute, I suspect it does. But again, we've never really seen this pushed. The reality is we've still got three open years. You know, three years of significantly open income, maybe six years. It depends upon how you look at whether you've actually included gross income or not. But at least three years of tax. And if it's an S corporation, you know, especially because we know clients love to set up S's because they want to take a minimum salary and flow out income, that there could be a really nice, decent, big tax bill that's due for those three years with the interest on top of it and penalties. So a buyer is going to, by definition, be somewhat concerned about even if you're buying assets in a case like that, you know, did, did you know the company was going to be bankrupted? You know, are you participating in a transaction you shouldn't have? And certainly if you're buying the stock and people tell me, well, people never buy stock. And my answer is the largest S Corp sale purchase I ever had was a stock purchase. So and I've recently had S Corp sales where it ended up being an asset purchase, but actually the buyer would have agreed to a stock purchase. The buyer was interested in the company regardless. And if the seller pushed for a stock purchase, you know, then they would have gone that route. So really, we do see stock purchases. And obviously, with a stock purchase, you really don't want that liability because you will walk right into it. So what happens in that case is we've got this sale. It's all ready to go, but the buyer will not release the check because it can't clear due diligence. That forces you to go back and get the letter ruling. As with before, you've got to pay the fee. Now, the IRS, as they often do in this case, they grant the request. They may impose some conditions. In this case, there were no real major conditions imposed except to change your articles of corporation to get rid of that. Uh, the reason why they didn't is because nothing ever really happened in the past. Everything was consistent as if it had been the other way. Nothing, nothing had happened to cause it to change. But because of that, you know, we ended up with our S. The other catch is, even if the buyer wasn't iffy on this, think about the seller now at this point. If you're selling assets, now you're going to have this really big gain inside the corporation. And if it turns out that the corporate election is no good, uh, yeah, you probably need to get that fixed, huh? Be before we go forward. So that's why we have a problem. Again, interesting issue. And S corporations, we see way too many of these private letter rulings on S's. This comes up more than you'd think, and it's not the IRS generally pushing it. It is that time of year. You're into all the deadlines. I know a week from, we released this on Monday officially, and a week from the 9th will be, of course, the date when the pass-throughs are due. Our first deadlines are coming up.
So you'll be hitting those left and right. It'll be great fun for everybody. Uh, but when you get past October 15th, remember, we've got all the year-end CPE. We've got bunches of it around. I'll be in conferences, I've, I've noted, in Washington. And I'll be in Arizona doing a conference, in Minnesota doing the conference. So I'll be in those tax conferences this year. We'll be doing uh, education courses. I'll have courses in Idaho, have courses in Michigan. You know, I'll be in Arizona, obviously, New Mexico again. So we'll be doing tons of work. Check your state society's CPE catalog. You know, you can check for the ones I'm doing. We have them listed on my website, on the I say our website here, Kaplan Financial's website, Current Federal Tax Developments. You can check for those there. But you can also check for other Kaplan instructors and other instructors uh, for your state society giving courses in this area. We've just now gotten more guidance. Now, I didn't mention that this week, the guidance under 451. Uh, which is the revenue conformity and the advanced payment rulings. We got those this week. They are a little more involved. I didn't want to rush going through them. So I'm going to look at them in more detail this week. We'll talk about them next week. But we're obviously going to have more regulations, more guidance, more things happening. So you probably want to come in this year and catch up on what's happening before we get to the new tax season. So make sure you check, sign in, and get that. This has been the Current Federal Tax Developments for the week of September the 9th, 2019. Current Federal Tax Developments are brought to you, as always, by Kaplan Financial Education and your State Society of CPAs. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Ed Zollers. If you have questions, you can email me, Ed Zollers at CurrentFelderTaxDevelopments.com. I do follow the online discussions. Uh, on the three Connect groups I mention each week. Uh, I am a member in Arizona, Minnesota, and New Jersey. I kind of keep my eye on discussions there. If I see something I think I can help with, I'll try to step in. I also follow along with Cal CPA's Tax Talk group. So I'll step into some of those conversations, and anyone can join that group. The first three are limited to members of those organizations, but the la that one is open to any CPA in the country who wants to join in. And finally, I also check the Reddit site, slash r slash tax pros. That is a Reddit group that where if you try to post a question that's clearly not for a professional, it will be move, it will be basically removed from the board. But it's a really good place to get some back and forth discussion as well about things that happen here in taxes. Well, as we said, the deadline weeks are coming up. So next week, we'll actually release this on the 16th. So once you've got your final pass-through done next week, you can go ahead and then check in there and check and see what's going on with taxes. We'll also be uh, you know, keeping up with what's happening in the week. I will cover the 451 stuff next week for sure. So we'll take a look, at, uh, and that'll probably be most of next week's uh, coverage because we have the conformity rules plus the advanced payment rules plus the accounting method change option for that. So I've already got a lot of material there. We'll see what else happens. Hopefully nothing earth-shattering because we got a pretty full plate already. And we'll see you then a week from now with Current Federal Tax Developments. And we'll see you throughout the rest of this year for the developments as they occur here in federal taxes.